So we're going to start out by taking a look at a really basic, what's the basic components of a bacterial cell, and then look at some of the many variations on this basic cell that you can have. So a reminder that bacteria and archaea are small in size, and this allows them to grow rapidly or divide rapidly um, because they also have a really simple cell structure. They're not having to make new organelles and things like that. So a scale on that size difference, bacteria and archaea are about one to five micrometers in diameter, whereas plant and animal cells are between 10 and 100 micrometers in diameter. So 10 to 20 times bigger um, than the bacterial archaeal cells. So like many things in nature, the smaller size comes with benefits and disadvantages. So um, bacterial cells can't store as much material. So if you think about like energy storage, they're not able to store stuff for the winter generally or different things like that. Um, so they're really relying on food right now because um, they're not going to be able to food, store food resources. But on the other hand, they're able to divide really quickly. So when they have resources available, they're able to really take advantage of those re resources by dividing rapidly. So this is a image of a prokaryotic cell. Um, so you have your basic components of a cell. So to remind you of what our basic components are, right, every cell to fit the definition of a cell, oops, all cells have to have a plasma membrane. That's the membrane that surrounds the cytosol, which is one of the other components, the fluid that fills the cell. They have to have ribosomes to make proteins, and they have to have their genetic material. in this organized form called chromosomes. So if we look at this example E. coli cell, um, we have a plasma membrane, we have the DNA, this chromosome. Um, in bacteria, the DNA is in the nucleoid region. So remember, they don't have a nucleus, but that is where their DNA is found, is this area called the nucleoid. So we've got our DNA, we've got our plasma membrane, the fluid inside of here is the cytosol, and these orange dots are ribosomes. So those, that's kind of the bare minimum to make a cell. Now a typical bacterial cell has many other features. So in this example, we also have a cell wall, we have flagella, and we have this exterior coating called a mucilage or glycocalyx that we'll talk about, as well as these pili. So there's many other features added on to your basic cell um, to, for most bacteria. So again, we're going to kind of explore some of these more complex structures. So inside of a bacterial cell, while we say that they do not have organelles, they still can have complex organization or structures in some cases. And so this is an example of that. This is called the thylakoids. That name probably sounds familiar because... Thylakoids are also part of the chloroplast. So why would thylakoids be part of the chloroplast? Well, remember that the chloroplast evolved from bacteria that colonized the inside of a eukaryotic cell. So the bacteria that colonized the inside of a eukaryotic cell had these thylakoid structures, and that's what gave rise to the thylakoids that are part of the chloroplast that is inside of a eukaryotic cell. So the thylakoids are these folds of membrane. So all these dark lines here, that's membrane folding in. So um, if I were to sort of more diagrammatically show you so that it's a little, it's not realistic as much, but it's showing you what's happening, the plasma membrane has folded in and made these thylakoids. And that's happening all over this cell is that the plasma membrane has folded in. Why would that do that? Or why would the cell do that? It increases the surface area. So all along of this membrane are the proteins that carry out photosynthesis. So by having these folds, it increases photosynthesis, makes these able to harvest energy from light more efficiently. So this cell also is an example of an additional important feature of many cells like this. And 
it's all this area here that almost looks like honeycomb. These are gas vesicles. They contain air and help the cell float. Why would a bacterial cell want to float? Well, this bacteria is probably living in water and it needs to be close to the surface to capture light. So it uses the gas vesicles in order to better optimize photosynthesis as well. So both thylakoids and gas vesicles help optimize photosynthesis for this cell. Another interesting feature that some bacteria have are magnetosomes. And so the magnetosomes are these little structures that run, run along in this chain on this bacteria right here. The magnetosomes contain magnetic iron called magnetite. Um, and so that magnetic, um, th so these structures help allow them to sense electromagnetic fields or uh, geomagnetic fields in the earth. And that um, uh, helps them operate kind of like a compass. And these bacteria have a strong preference for certain habitats. And so the compass function helps them find their optimal habitat. So um, different bacteria that have cells that are shaped differently. So in these examples we've been seeing, this is a rod shaped, this is a sphere, and we had a rod shaped one here. So we're seeing some variation in shape. And so that's particular to different types of bacteria. So certain bacteria always have the same shape. So um, there's five major shapes. The technical name for the sphere shaped one is cosi. The technical name for rod shaped bacteria are bacilli. Some bacteria are shaped like commas. These are called vibrios. And then we have two variations of spiral-shaped ones. Spirochetes have a flexible spiro, spiral, while spirilli have a rigid spiral. So there's, they kind of look the same if they're not moving, but they're a little bit different in their form. Um, in addition to these five shapes, um, Bacteria also can organize differently, so sometimes they always hang out by themselves, sometimes they hang out in pairs, sometimes they hang out in filaments. So bacteria that hang out individually or prefer to hang out individually might look like this. Um, sometimes you have bacteria that hang out in pairs. They also sometimes hang out in specific types of clusters, so almost looking like a grape a grape cluster, for example. Um, you have bacteria that hang out in chains called filaments. So some rod-shaped bacteria, that's what I'm drawing here, hang out in chains. They almost look like sausages on li or linked sausage. Um, sausage when it's still attached to itself. Um, so these are micrographs of these different shapes. So these are um, electron microscopy which allows us to see small cells like bacteria in much higher resolution. Um, in When you're using a light microscope, you're generally not going to see, well, you're never going to see the bacteria looking this big. Um, so your resolution is going to be a little bit um, less as far as determining shape. So just be aware of that. Um, but this is kind of what they look like at high resolution. And we see um, a cosi in... Uh, pairs. We see uh, the, the bacilli in pairs, vibrios, just uh, individual single cells, and here's spiral cells. Um, also, I'll point out to you that in many cases, the shape of the bacteria is reflected in its name. So this is lactococcus. So notice that it has that term there that's referencing its shape, lactobacillus. So referencing that it's rod-shaped. Vibrio cholera, referencing that it's comma shaped. And here's Leptospira jaundice. And here's a reference to its spiral shape. So it's not always true, but a lot of times um, there's a reference to the shape of the bacteria um, in its name. So on the outside of many bacterial cells, they also have a coating. So you might have your membrane and then it's going to secrete out of the cell. So it's made by the cell. 
some kind of layer called either the mucilage or the glycocalyx. Let me be clear here that this is not the same thing as the cell wall. So many bacteria will also have a cell wall. So they'll have a cell membrane, the glycocalyx, and a cell wall. Okay, all three of those are different things. Let me write this. This is an area of confusion, so let me highlight this. The membrane, the cell wall, and the glycocalyx, also called mucilage, depending on the form it takes. These are three distinct things. And many bacteria have all three of them or two of them. They always have a membrane, okay? Um, the glycocalyx is a little bit special um, because of it's the mixture that it is. It's polysaccharides, protein, or both. And it tends to have almost gel-like qualities, especially if it's high in polysaccharides. So it's, or you could also almost say slimy. Depending on the bacteria um, and the context, the function of the mucilage is really varied. In some bacteria, the glycocalyx is a really distinct structure called a capsule. So if this bacteria, if this is its membrane, a capsule would be an additional rounded structure surrounding that membrane that helped protect it. So it's almost like a moat of a castle. If the immune system of a host is trying to attack this bacterial cell, so here's the cell, oops, right there. it has this extra protection of a capsule that makes it harder for the host immune system to get to the cell itself. Um, so that's one of the, and, and this can contribute to disease. So um, the types of, certain types of bacteria will make people or animals sick because they have a capsule. And if, it, if the bacteria doesn't have a capsule, then it doesn't make people or animals sick. So it has really important disease consequences. Um, the glycocalyx can also create a substrate that just helps hold bacteria together. So remember, a colony is bacteria all living together in one group. Well, in among those cells is mucilage that helps them adhere to each other. Um, so they're not just like floating around loose, they're actually adhering. Um, and then sort of in line or similar to that, um, glycocalyx also is the base for biofilms. So imagine you have some rigid substrate. So the example we'll talk the most about is teeth. So teeth are made out of enamel. This is like a hard, non-living substrate. Um, and most things can't adhere to that. So living cells can't adhere to enamel. So as long as it's bare enamel, then bacteria can adhere to it. But what bacteria will do is they will get onto this enamel and secrete mucilage. So the green is my mucilage. So they coat the enamel with mucilage and now bacteria can adhere to that mucilage. And so this is what plaque is. And so when you go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned, part of what they're scraping off is the plaque buildup. That's also when you brush your teeth, you're helping to prevent that from happening. So every time you're brushing your teeth, you're removing bacteria that might be able to develop this. Um, so teeth is the most common example. You can also get biofilms um, on plastics. So think about um, if you've ever had like a pet bowl or a bowl outside for some reason filled with water, you eventually get this kind of slimy coat on the glass or plastic um, of the bowl from bacteria as well as other organisms like fungi starting to lay down a biofilm that they then all happily congregate on together. It can also happen inside of the body. So one of the things that we've had to be careful with is with um, certain medical equipment. This is both like outside, like respirators um, and equipment like that can develop a biofilm that bacteria can um, grow in. So they have to change that now. They didn't realize this would happen at first because they thought nothing could live on plastic. But as soon as they lay down the biofilm, then bacteria can live on it and it could keep infecting somebody's lungs if there was bacteria in their respirator equipment. 
Um, it can happen inside someone. So if they've had some kind of implant, um, like a hip replacement or a pacemaker, things like that have the potential to have a biofilm forming on them as well. So they've had to really think about that in, in some of the in, uh, new kinds of technologies, addressing how to prevent biofilms from forming by the materials that they use, um, or being aware that a biofilm could have formed. And if that happens, somebody can end up with recurring of infections um, that need to be addressed differently than just a one-time infection.